Good morning, everyone. It is good to be with you, even though geographically we are not together. It is a wonderful thing to be able to use this kind of technology and know that we can be in spirit together. For those of you who are listening in from other churches or other church families or from the community, welcome to this uh, live feed from Facebook. We hope you are all encouraged by our time together. One of the greatest blessings I believe that we have in Christ Jesus is this idea of assurance in Christ, mm -hmm. this security that's been talked about this morning in Christ Jesus. Fanny Crosby, a songwriter of an old hymn called Blessed Assurance, was blind. But she had a clear vision of who she was in the sight of God and who God was. And you can see this in every song she writes. There is this spiritual vision of God in the song. She actually stated once, and I'm going to quote her, it seemed intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life. And I thank him for the dispensation. If perfect earthly sight were offered me tomorrow, I would not accept it. I might not have written hymns to the praise of God if I had been distracted by the beautiful and interesting things about me. For Crosby, she realized that earthly sight had its disadvantages. She recognized that spiritual vision was of supreme value and the greater blessing, perhaps, than anything that she could ever have in life. This is a time when we need more than ever this spiritual vision. Jesus stated important principles about spiritual vision in John the ninth chapter after he healed a blind man and his critics were wondering about his authority at that time. But Jesus said in verse 39, for judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. So there he's talking about this spiritual vision. And he says that there are those who do not see, and I'm going to make them be able to have this spiritual vision. And yet there are also those who think they see, and they are actually blind. Now those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things, and they said to him, we are not blind too, are we? Now listen to Jesus's response. If you were blind, you would have no sin, but since you say, we see, your sin remains. This statement by Jesus is a profound truth about vision. If we arrogantly think that we know it all, that we have it all, that we comprehend everything, then we are actually blind in his sight. If, however, we confess our spiritual blindness to God and our inability to see him without his intervention, mm -hmm. then he has the power to make us truly see. That assurance that we have in Jesus Christ produces trust in him. Mm -hmm. And that trust is the thing that produces peace even during a time of trial. Listen to these words of Peter in 1 Peter, the first chapter, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you, 
Now listen to his secure words here, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found in result and to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Do you see the wording there about our protection with the power of God and the fact that we don't physically see Jesus, but we are seeing him through the eye of faith? And in this time of uncertainty, of marked changes in our lifestyle and of threats of pandemic. And we need to have this trust in the blessed assurance that God gives us. So how do we deal with the fear of infection? How do we deal with the separation and this time of social distancing? How do we deal with a sad hoarding of some who obviously are selfish and are not thinking with a community spirit? And how do we deal with lockdown restrictions that we recognize are good for us, but they really do impose upon our ability to fellowship with one another? Well, first of all, I think we have to rest our minds in the fact that God knows everything. God knows the beginning and the end of this pandemic. He knows how it began. We don't even know the exact way, probably. And we have no idea when it will end. This story is not yet ended for us, but he knows it all. We as a nation can do so much more than ever before in history to stem a pandemic. And yet, we are left with just flattening the curve, because that is life under the sun. Our Heavenly Father knows these things. And Jesus said that God knows the very hairs on our head, and even when a sparrow falls to earth. The other day, I was working in my garage, and I saw a bee fall to the ground. And, and I thought, he's done his work according to God's plan and he falls now, and he doesn't have any more work that he can do. But God knows that he fell, and that is a beautiful thing to me. And even greater than God's knowledge is the idea that God cares. There's one thing about being God and knowing everything, but there's still another, another more beautiful thing, that would say, this God who knows all things cares about us and cares to give us an, an answer to our anxieties. First Peter, again, five, six through nine. Here is what Peter says. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Anxiety is a heavy, heavy load. And the devil knows that. An angry, hungry lion is a fearful thing. And the devil knows that. 
But I love Peter's wording here in this passage because he says, cast all your anxieties, which means to throw it all to God. You know, Peter didn't say, carefully remove all of those anxieties off your shoulders, take a look at each one, figure out which one you need to keep, and then give the others to God and ask him to take them away. No, he says, throw them overboard like useless weight on a ship that's taking on water. Cast them to God. Get rid of them. God can handle all of our anxieties, all of our fears, because he knows the end from the beginning, and he has protected our end with his perfect power. Peter also says that this casting away of anxieties is a result of humbling ourselves before God. You know that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Jesus came to this world. The most exalted God took on flesh and came to this world, but he came in a humble way so that he might learn obedience. This Jesus was acquainted with griefs. He dealt with sorrows. He agonized through trials so that he, as the Hebrew writer says, could become our perfect mediator, knowing everything that we have gone through as well and that we go through, so that we can say that our Jesus has made it well with our souls. God promises to lift us up in due time. God knows it all. He knows our anxieties and fears. He knows the end from the beginning, and he has made our life in him completely protected mm -hmm. by our son. Second, our response to all of this always needs to be love. We must realize that every trial, every test, every hardship also offers opportunities. And sometimes those opportunities will be unique. This is where the vision of a Christian is so important. The world often sees the necessity to serve its own interest during times of hardships. The Christian sees the opportunity to advance the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in these difficult, difficult times, especially when people are saying to us, we can't be together physically, we think, well, then there's nothing we can do. And then I sometimes, to my dismay, begin to think, well, I cannot do for people this overwhelming thing that needs to be done because I'm just one person rather than thinking of what I can do in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. For we all have his power working within us. We need then to be ready for the opportunities that may even surprise us during this time. So here are some things that I would like to suggest. First and foremost, check on those who are most needy. Check on our elderly those that are compromised by health issues. Maybe you're close by, maybe you can order something for them and have it delivered, or maybe you can go get something at a store or at a pharmacy and bring it to them so they don't have to get out and venture out for any of the necessities that they need. Secondly, if you know of a member of our church family who's losing work time or maybe even losing their job, make sure that your shepherds know as well so that we can evaluate and supply their needs. Third, pray with people over the phone, with FaceTime, with your devices, on any of those un unusual and beautiful ways that we've been given as a blessing. And sometimes they become a curse to us because we spend too much time on them. Now is our time that we can reach out to each other. And always, as was said before, consider your neighbors. Consider those out in the world. There are people possibly in your neighborhood whose children would get a free or reduced 
breakfast and lunch every day at school that may be going hungry at this time, if you can't supply their need, let us know and we will find somebody who can do that. Let's always ask ourselves the question, what does love tell me to do in this situation? Though I truly believe not meeting together physically is an act of love at this time, I also believe that there are more acts of love that can be done. We have a blessed assurance from God that transcends all earthly guarantees. Mm -hmm. In these uncertain times, remember the words of your father in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and in verse five, I will never fail you. I will never leave you. At this time, Kirk will lead us in a closing prayer.